this is where we finished off. We were talking about um, classification of organisms and I was just kind of getting into nomenclature and had introduced the binomial naming system. Um, so this is really what I care about in some ways the most in this class uh, other than domain. So you care the program of eukarya. Um, but in terms of your lab reports and things like that, it's important and essential that you get the naming system right. So genus and species, uh, genus is capitalized, species is not. Um, they're gonna be in italics. And if it's uh, handwritten, you're gonna underline it. You don't have it in italics, you don't have it uh, underlined. Uh, that's uh, technically a spelling error and that is incorrect. And uh, so watch for that in your lab report. So I'll we'll be trying to remind you a few times over the uh, semester. Uh, let's take a look at some examples of uh, the binomial naming system in action. Uh, so here's an example of a mammal. And uh, most names are somewhat descriptive in some sort. Uh, not always, they try to be descriptive, and those are the best names. You can see this one here, Felis domesticus. That means domestic cat. Uh, and uh, Felis and domesticus are, are Latin. Um, we already saw one Staphylococcus. We talked about Staphylococcus epidermidus last day, so that is found on your skin. And here is another Staphylococcus that is found uh, on your skin. So here's the thing, epidermidus was already taken, so we can't call this one Staphylococcus epidermidus. Uh, it's still Staphylococcus, that's the genus, so it's closely related. Uh, and, and remember Staphylococcus, um, remember Staph here, means cluster, and caucus means sphere. So you can see you have the same type of arrangement there of the cells, right? Uh, but this one here, aureus, um, if you think about your periodic table, most people usually remember what this one is on the periodic table. And that, of course, is gold. And when you grow these on a Petri dish, you can see they have a nice golden color. So there's another descriptive name. I'll show you a few more examples. Uh, here's one uh, that I saw in the Guinness Book of World Records. So this is Dinococcus radiodurans, and the Guinness Book was calling it the world's toughest bacterium. Uh, it turns out that this particular organism was found in a nuclear reactor. Um, enough radiation to kill a human 200 times fold. Uh, so this was a really tough organism. So if you take a look at this, Dino, that's the same dino from dinosaurs. It means terrible, like terrible lizards, but in this case, terrible uh, caucus. So caucus is sphere. So maybe I could write that down. Terrible sphere. And this means resistant to radiation, radio durans. Uh, so again, a descriptive name. Here's a few more examples, and then uh, we'll move on. Um, Escherichia coli, this is an organism that we are going to be looking at in the lab, and it was named after um, a pediatrician, Theodore Escherich, so named after a person in this case. Uh, coli uh, means colon, right, so that's your, your large intestine, but it's found in, in both large and small intestines. Uh, sometimes we see other people in there, so if you take a look at this one here, I don't actually know what type of organism this is, but um, Attenboroughsaurus, so a dinosaur named after the famous naturalist David Attenborough. Um, here's another one here, uh, Scaptia Beyonce. So you're probably looking at that and thinking, okay, Beyonce, uh, what is she known for? Well, she is known for her beautiful golden hair. And uh, so when they saw this fly, they were reminded of her hair color and uh, named it after uh, after Beyonce. So I guess that one is in honor of her, or at least a characteristic that reminded the uh, discoverer or the namer of, of her hair. Um, how about this one here? Here's one named after, well, you know who, Donald Trump. Um, also named after his hair color and style. This is a wasp of some sort, and it kind of had the right hair color, and it sort of looked like a comb over, and so they had to name it after him. Um, so you see this kind of things uh, pretty common nowadays. We're kind of running out of ideas. You know, how many ways can, can you describe a fly or a bacterium? So sometimes people name things after uh, people they know. 
Sometimes other things, uh, geographical locations have creeped in there. So Long Beach, California, um, Legionella, in fact, uh, it was a Legionnaires convention. Legionnaires are people who served in the military. Uh, and, and so this particular organism was uh, discovered in California at a Legionnaires convention. So this is kind of the key thing to remember to use this properly in your lab reports. Okay, uh, remember that it's in italics or it's underlined if it's handwritten. And uh, generally what we do is the first time you write the name in a report, you're gonna use the full name. So for example, Escherichia coli or Homo sapiens. And then after that, uh, usually you're gonna use the abbreviation. So the genus with the capital uh, of the first letter of the genus. So Escherichia becomes E and then a period because it's an abbreviation it becomes E. coli. Homo sapiens becomes H sapiens and so on. It's a reminder to get that right because uh, you will lose marks if you do not do it properly in your lab reports. So I will try to remind you again and again. So what about viruses? Um, how are we gonna name those things? So viruses aren't cells, they're not alive and they have their own system. Um, there is actually, believe it or not, an international committee for the nomenclature of viruses uh, and, and they don't agree on everything. Um, sometimes they're italicized, but not usually. Uh, so we won't italicize them because that's the general convention. And usually what you have is some sort of descriptive word followed by the word virus. Sometimes it's all one word. Sometimes it's, uh, there's, a, there's no space in between. Um, the best ones are the ones named after, after their disease. So you can see I have some examples here, rabies virus, influenza virus, herpes simplex virus, right? Uh, influenza, it turns out there's A, B, and C. There's three different types. So they have incorporated that into the name. Uh, sometimes it's named after scientists. Uh, so Epstein and Barr were two different scientists that discovered this particular virus. Uh, so you do see that. Sometimes it's named after geographical locations and people don't like that so much. Ebola is actually a river uh, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in Africa. And uh, so it was named after that river. You don't see a lot of tourism to that river, do you? <laughs> um, so people don't usually like that. Norwalk virus has, um, has uh, become renamed to norovirus because the people of Norwalk, Connecticut did not like that. They, they're like, we don't want a virus named after us, please rename it. Um, and uh, you can see our, our new virus, the one that's the uh, responsible for the pandemic, its name is SARS-CoV-2. And uh, so that actually uh, has a, that's an abbreviation, which uh, SARS uh, stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, and COVID-2 is coronavirus 2. So this is the second SARS virus that was discovered and they're coronaviruses. Corona, by the way, we'll talk about what it means. It actually means crown. And they thought that the little spikes looked like jewels on a crown. So uh, that's kind of where the name came from. All right, so here is a quick one to think about. Um, this says, which are the proper ways to describe this dinosaur? Um, there are actually, two correct answers here. So let's take a look at these one by one, and then, I, um, and then we'll move on. So Tyrannosaurus rex, the first one here. That is not good because the species name should have a small uh, letter, not a big letter. Uh, second one, this one is okay. Remember, uh, italics or underlines, the genus is capitalized and the, uh, the species is not. Uh, this one here is not correct. Um, we've got capital and punctuation issues. Uh, this one here, you can see T, that, that's actually the name of a kid's book, by the way. Uh, this one here, who, who knows what's going on? Uh, this one looks good. This one and this one do not look good. So just remember those rules. Uh, and uh, usually I have a question on the midterm, uh, something like this. So you can do that. Easy mark. Uh, by the way, there are, are other things called T-Rex. Um, that are other organisms besides the famous dinosaur. Uh, you can see Tacrocytes rex. I'm not sure exactly how to say that is actually uh, the name of a, of a, a mole rat and, and so on. And then there's other places just for fun. You can see some restaurants and things like that in there. 
So that was just for fun. Okay, so I want to move on and talk about science and the scientific method. This is where I was hoping to start to today, but a few minutes behind. That's okay. So what is science? Um, science comes from the word Latin scientia to mean to know. So technically what it is, is it's a, a system to gain knowledge. And you can see there's a definition I got off the internet and it talks about being a systematic system for um, studying the physical natural world through two things, observation and experiment. A lot of people, when they talk about science, they're focusing on the experimental aspect of science, but science uh, does have a lot to do with observation as well. And I'll, I'll uh, kind of get into that here um, as I pick apart some of the details here. So two types of science, you can think about it. Um, although they're, they're obviously, they're, they're interconnected. Uh, we can talk about discovery science, so discovery science is mostly observational. So let's say you have discovered uh, a new species of squirrel and um, you can, you can, you're not doing any experiments. You're just writing down some details about it. Okay, it has a, a gray coat, it eats acorns. Um, the male is, uh, you know, let's say uh, 300 grams and the female is 200 grams. Um, no experiments uh, required there, but you are getting information and you're contributing to the knowledge base of the, uh, of the natural world. Uh, it can be a little bit more advanced, can be statistical, you can look at genome databases, uh, all those kind of things and so on. The type of science that uh, uh, we often talk about in school a lot is uh, hypothesis-driven science, and we are going to talk about that a little bit more here today in terms of the scientific method and, and so on. Um, there's just some more examples of, um, of discovery science, so feeding habits of whales, uh, databases of genomes, a uh, new squirrel, I think I mentioned that one already. So this is careful, systematic observation, and uh, like I said, you can expand that to data analysis as well, and, uh, and that would be uh, discovery science. So hypothesis-driven science um, is... Uh, uh, is, is where we are going to talk about today. Uh, and we're talking about things like experiments and formulating hypotheses and things like that. And uh, here's a little flow chart, that talks a little bit about the scientific method. And you can see there's, a, there's quite, a, quite a bit different parts in there. And sometimes people skip a part or they, they don't start at the beginning, those kind of things. And, and uh, so kind of a little bit of what, what, about what I wanna talk about today, right? So often we talk about forming a hypothesis. So we'll talk about hypotheses in a moment, but you can see that uh, that's right here in the central part of the entire flow chart, forming a hypothesis. So you could have a hypothesis about, uh, you know, let's say uh, you're, you're concerned that coffee is, uh, you know, causing some sort of a heart problem, right? And so that's your hypothesis that coffee is the cause of, let's say uh, elevated blood pressure, right? So you can, do that experiment. You can have people drink coffee and you can measure their blood pressure. So very, very basic kind of thing. Um, generally though, uh, at some point you've done your test. You can see if we're going, moving down, you can see uh, the, the test is done here and you analyze the results. And then at that point, in many cases, you're asking, okay, um, does my data support the hypothesis? And you have two possibilities, kind of yes or no. Or sometimes you're repeating the experiment to kind of, you know, something didn't go right and whatnot. But if the hypothesis is not supported, maybe you're going to revise your hypothesis. Maybe it's coffee and sugar. Maybe it's coffee and milk. Um, maybe it's tea, right? Uh, there's lots of possibilities there. Uh, something else to consider is that science is not necessarily linear, meaning we're not necessarily, like I said, starting at the beginning sometimes. You're doing the experiment, then you're doing it again, you're doing it again, you're trying uh, different controls and all those kind of things. And then another thing that's often missed when you talk about the scientific method is really interactions with the scientific community, which is kind of down over here. Uh, lots of people do scientific experiments, um, but if you're not publishing and letting people know and having other people sort of scrutinize the data and those kind of things, um, it, it may or may not be legitimate. And another last thing is science is often never done. Um, often we're still raising new questions and looking for new, uh, uh, new understandings of things.
So I want to talk a little bit about hypotheses and variables and things like that. And we're going to kind of expand those concepts in the lab. Uh, but just want to show you some examples from history of some hypotheses and some experiments to kind of tease out some of the details there. So first of all, what is a hypothesis? So a hypothesis is, um, you can see there's some, some kind of you know, brief definitions there. So some people think of it as an explanation or an educated guess. Um, it's kind of an explanation that you think this does this, or and this is why, right? And um, hypothesis can be very basic. Coffee causes high blood pressure, or it can be much more detailed. Coffee causes high blood pressure because of the interaction of the molecule with uh, uh, you know, the vascular system of the human body, right? And you can, you can go into a lot more details. The best hypotheses are testable, meaning we can design an experiment around it, but also that the experiment can maybe even falsify the hypothesis. Um, so this is something to keep in mind when you're uh, formulating a hypothesis. So I'm gonna stop there for a minute and uh, we're gonna do a Kahoot just to kind of break up the lecture here. I wanted to do this right off the bat and uh, go back to some of the classification nomenclature stuff. So um, if you have your phone or whatever, you can, uh, you can load up the app and I will load this up in a second. All right, here we go. So join in when you have a second here, it should uh, load the, uh, the game pin here any second now. There it is, 15 more seconds and we'll get started. All right, here we go. Just keep in mind, you can join in any time. The pin number should be at the, uh, I think it's at the bottom of the screen once we get started. Question one, what does a eukaryote have that a prokaryote does not? All right, I'm hoping that one was easy. Um, in fact, you can see in the picture here, the eukaryote here is shown down here and has a nucleus. Eukaryote, remember, it means true nucleus. Question two, which of the following are proper ways to name the dinosaur? Oh, maybe I gave that answer away already in the, uh, in the lecture. So the correct answer is this one here. Uh, if you take a look at the green answer, um, there's a, a large R in Rex and uh, the species should always have uh, lowercase small letters on. And uh, the first one red is incorrect because it's missing the punctuation. Punctuation does matter. Question three, in your lab report, species name should So in your lab reports, they should be underlined when handwritten or italicized when uh, typed. So the correct answer is either is okay. Which of the following shows the proper way to name a virus? Okay, how did we do? So the correct answer is rabies virus. Um, so the blue one, herpes virus, there's a hyphen in there. That's not usually the, uh, the format we use. 
um, there will either be no space or a space, but not, not a hyphen. Uh, COVID-19 is actually not the name of the virus. Um, it's actually an acronym that stands for Co uh, Coronavirus Disease 2019. Um, so the correct one is rabies virus, usually some sort of descriptive thing and then virus. All right, so Ramil is in the lead. Last one, a hypothesis. Okay, all of the above. So well done on that. Let us see how the um, podium results have come out. Bronze, we have Muhammad, well done. Silver, Mahdi. And Ramil, okay, well done. All right, so those will probably, uh, I'm gonna to continue to have them, maybe not every lecture necessarily, um, but uh, I will have them uh, probably at least once or twice a week. And uh, as we really get into the material, they're gonna get a little bit more difficult. First couple are easy, just get everyone into it. But I'm, and I will also have them posted eventually on Moodle. So if you wanna rerun through them, I uh, encourage you to uh, go through and review. Anytime you're not getting things right, it's always good to review and figure out what, uh, what you're missing there. So hypotheses, right? Some sort of reasonable explanation uh, to explain a phenomenon. I wanna show you uh, something from, from history. Um, this was the 1800s. I think this was the 1840s or 50s. I can't remember the exact time. Um, this guy here, Ignaz Assimilas, he's a Hungarian doctor and uh, there were women dying in his hospital. Um, and these were women who were um, giving birth to children. And um, he was trying to figure out what was going on. And let me just show you some of the hypotheses he tested. And he tested many ideas um, because at this time, uh, we did not have an understanding scientifically of infection. It was about 30 years too early. So he tested, okay, was this fever done by uh, women I don't know, laying on their sides or instead of their backs, that kind of thing, right? Um, there was a church on the street and there was a bell ringing and uh, the thought was, you know, maybe these women were in fearful of their mortality and scaring them to a fever. Now, like I said, um, these are silly, but you know what? He went and tested these hypotheses. Um, were they uh, victims of poisonous gas that had got into the ward? Uh, this was actually a popular theory at the time that miasma or bad smells were the cause of, of illnesses. And, and in some ways, that's not far from the truth. And a lot of things that are infectious are, um, um, can make you sick. Onside of lactation, overcrowding, and it turns out that last one that he eventually tested was the true answer, that the fever was caused by doctors on clean hands. It turns out a lot of them were actually dissecting human cadavers at the time. And when a woman would come in, they would just walk into the room. There'd be no hand washing or anything like that. And um, so he actually got them to change their ways. And uh, unfortunately, at the time, people did not believe him um, that disease was, would be caused by unclean hands and he, he got fired. Um, interesting kind of history of science moment. Um, but you can look it up. It's a really sad story. So let, let's talk about experiment design now. Um, hypothesis is part of it, you know, some sort of idea of what you think is going to happen, right? Um, and then usually when you set up an experiment, there's, there's a bunch of things to consider depending on, on what you're trying. Uh, one is you, you need a group uh, of, of things to experiment on. Uh, usually we don't just experiment on one thing, right? Like if I want to know does coffee cause high blood pressure, I'm not usually going to test just one person. Um, because you know what, everyone's a little different. And, and what if it's a fluke? What if that person, um, something else is causing the high blood pressure in them that day that you can't uh, control for, right? So you usually have a group of, of, of things you're experimenting on. It could be a, a bunch of mice. It could be some humans. It, you could be experimenting on, uh, on um, you know, bean plants or, 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 you know, all sorts of different things, right? So that's your experimental group. 
And then usually you're going to have um, a couple of, of variables, right? So one variable that you, as the experimenter, are changing. And we call that the independent variable. Um, and uh, in, in the case of the coffee, that's, that's giving people coffee, basically, or not giving them coffee, or how much coffee to give them, right? So this is the thing that is controlled. Sometimes people call it the control variable, right? Uh, the dependent variable, or the responding variable, is the thing that is going to be measured. Right, so uh, the blood pressure in that case. Um, so you, usually that's pretty straightforward as long as you can get uh, the two things kind of sorted out. And I um, actually have another uh, ex uh, historical experiment we'll pick apart in a minute. Uh, another thing to consider is besides an experimental group, usually people will have a control group, right? So people not getting the coffee, let's say. Um, and, uh, you know, that way you can monitor that, you know, just in case there's something else going on, you know, what if it's a uh, barometric pressure in the atmosphere during the day? What if it's the amount of sunlight or, you know, something else that's in the atmosphere that you can't control for? So you have a control group just to kind of, you know, compare them with the experimental group to make sure that uh, nothing else uh, in the room is doing something weird. Uh, sometimes you have negative controls uh, where no phenomena is expected. Uh, sometimes you have positive controls, you know, maybe something else that's raising blood pressure and uh, you're comparing it with that. Let's say you're comparing coffee and tea or something like that, right? So let, let's take a look at another um, historical experiment um, also to do with infectious disease. So this is about 20 or 30 years after uh, Ignaz Semmel was. And um, this is where humans um, are starting to get an, uh, a much better understanding of, of germs and pathogens and disease. And so this is Robert Koch, he's a German fellow, and he believed that infectious diseases were in fact caused by um, things like bacteria. But how to prove it? Because people were still talking about these miasmas and spontaneous generation and you know things like that were still ideas were still floating around. So um, the uh, disease he was, he was initially working on is actually called anthrax. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about anthrax here and there. I'll pop it up a couple of times over the semester. Uh, this is a soil bacterium. You can see there's an image of it on the right there. It's actually called Bacillus anthracis. And uh, we know now it's, it's well understood to be, uh, it's usually an animal disease. Sometimes humans get it, but it's found in the soil. And so, you know, animals that uh, kind of, you know, snuff around in the dirt. You know, they're eating grass and things like that. Sometimes they inhale it, get it in the lungs, and they can die from anthrax. So this used to be a really serious disease. You know, um, farmers and their livestock were, were uh, not very happy. They were dying all the time. And, and um, so what to do about this? So he's thinking about this a lot. And one of the things he discovered is when he looked at the sick animals, he found this bacterium. It seemed like every time. So he kind of wanted to use that basis to, to test his experiment. So here's this experiment, right? You've got your um, number one, this is your, um, your sick or dead animal, right? And uh, he, he observes that, uh, that organism under a microscope. So the next step he did is he would culture that organism. So that's what step two is. Culture means you're growing it up in the lab and, uh, and culturing it as a pure organism. You don't want some sort of mixture or something like that. So he had actually invent a lot of techniques around microbial culturing. Uh, in fact, one of his students was uh, Julius Petrie, who invented the Petri dish, uh, who helped him out with that. Uh, next, he's basically taking and injecting the pathogen into a, uh, a healthy uh, animal. And then lastly, observing uh, once again, the sick animal. So it seems really straightforward. Um, but there is a lot of thought that went into this because this is something that had not actually been done before. And like I said, people were not having this understanding of linking certain bacteria with uh, certain organisms. So I um, kind of want to break apart and take a look at the, uh, uh, the components of this experiment. Maybe what I need to do is just erase. Um, I need to erase my writing here. So just give me a second here, make some more space. Okay, there we go. And I'll turn this back into a pen. Ooh, second uh, pointer options, pen. Uh, maybe we'll try a new ink color while we're at it. Let's go with, I think that's purple. I like purple. 
Okay. Um, so, like I said, the initial problem was, okay, what um, does this bacterium, does Bacillus anthracis cause uh, anthrax in animals? So that really is directly, in this case, linked to his hypothesis. So his hypothesis is that uh, Bacillus anthracis, anthracis causes anthrax. Okay, and I could put it right in animals. I'm not going to not going to write all that out. Um, so in many cases, that's that's the case. Your question and your hypothesis are linked uh, very directly. Sometimes they're a little bit more different. Um, you know, sometimes the hypothesis is a little bit more directed. The, uh, the problem might be what causes anthrax, whereas the hypothesis is bacillus bacilli and the races causes anthrax. But like I said, kind of kind of uh, very closely related. So what was his uh, experimental group? So his experimental group were mice. Um, and as a control group were mice. There was a difference here is that his experiment group were mice that were inoculated with the bacterium. Inoculated with bacteria. Uh, his control group were mice that were not inoculated. So they were given all the same living conditions. They were fed the same food, put in the same cages, in the same room, and all those kind of things. Um, and uh, that's kind of generally standard practice. You want to make sure there's not something bad with the food or bad with the air or who knows what else is going on in that laboratory. So you treat them exactly the same. The difference is you do not inoculate them uh, with the bacteria. So what were the variables he's looking for? Um, the, uh, the independent variable was basically the, um, the bacteria, so we will say maybe we'll say the presence, um, presence or absence of the bacteria. So basically, did the inoculation occur or not? And uh, the dependent variable is basically do we see disease, presence or absence. of disease. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about positive and negative controls here and things like that. Um, we're gonna get a chance to kind of tease apart variables and things like that in the lab and uh, design, a, design a few experiments ourselves. And um, so we'll, we'll come back to this in the lab. I'm not gonna to say too much more on this uh, today. So a uh, couple other things to think about when we are talking about science. Um, first of all, can the scientific process always be used? And uh, so this is kind of one of those big open-ended, uh, I guess you could say almost philosophical questions, right? Um, you know, and, and think about like some of these questions here, right? How did the universe form? How did life originate? How did the dinosaurs go extinct? Um, so I guess, what is the scientific process, right? Remember the scientific process involves a hypothesis, uh, usually some sort of experiment and, and so on, right? So we can't do an experiment with the dinosaurs going extinct. Um, you can't, like we don't have a whole bunch of planets and we can try different things, right? Um, but you can still use the scientific process, right? You probably know about the dinosaurs and you know, this hypothesis around, uh, around a meteor hitting the earth, right? So if that's the hypothesis, um, then you can, you can test things that are consistent with that data. You can look for a meteor impact site. You can look at um, uh, debris in the geological record that would be consistent with materials in a um, meteorite uh, and those kind of things. So you can, you can use science to, you know, maybe not, you can't necessarily prove things with science, but you can find ways to support a hypothesis. And, uh, and who knows, maybe someday we'll have a, a better hypothesis around um, the dinosaur extinction. Um, but you can use the scientific method uh, at least to some degree, at least bits and pieces of it. And, and these kind of things are used in all sorts of other uh, kind of social sciences like history. You know, we can talk about, uh, you know, hypothesis around uh, how Napoleon was killed. You know, if he, if he was poisoned, you can you know, maybe exhume his body and, and 
test test it. And I mean, there, there's lots of things like that. It may not necessarily prove it, but it does lean support towards a hypothesis. Um, there are other areas of knowledge that are maybe uh, a little harder to tease out. Um, are Canadians smarter than Americans? Um, you take a psychology course, you'll see there's a lot of um, a lot of issues around uh, you know trying to ascertain um, uh, you know uh, uh, intelligence and whatnot, and 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 uh, you know intelligence tests are, are really not very good in some ways. Um, what about love? What is it? Uh, is that even science? Like that's now we're starting to get into you know metaphysics and philosophy. So there are other branches of of knowledge out there that are not science. Um, so the scientific process is great, um, but it doesn't necessarily cover everything uh, in terms of uh, you know human knowledge. You know, there's another one there. Is there is there God? Um, so lots lots of uh, lots of things we could say about science. Just keep in mind it isn't everything. Uh, and although it can be useful. So that kind of leads me to this last experiment here. I just wanted to kind of show you something else that's kind of interesting. Um, this was a scientific experiment done in the 1970s, and uh, it was done by Stanley Miller. And he had this question about early Earth and, and you know, what was early Earth like and, and, and how could life originate, right? So what he did is... Uh, he took a, a chemistry setup. You can see he put in some things that they thought might be common in the early Earth atmosphere, so methane, or ammonia, and hydrogen gas. And they're like, well, I bet you there was lots of lightning. And so they zapped it with some electricity and then basically collected uh, what, they, uh, what they produced. And they found uh, some, some basic uh, um, organic molecules. And uh, so a lot of people herald this today as, okay, this is how life originated. Um, and, and so, this is kind of the question, right? In terms of, you know, was a scientific method used? Uh, certainly, uh, Stanley Miller had a hypothesis, um, but it kind of depends on what that hypothesis was in terms of how scientific this was, because did he create life? No, he certainly did not. Um, are we closer to understanding how life originated? Maybe. Um, there are lots of people who've done very similar experiments um, and they've created different types of molecules and whatnot. Um, nobody has yet achieved creating life. We're probably never, ever going to be that close to being able to do so. Um, so like I said, it kind of depends on what the actual hypothesis is. If his hypothesis is that he could create uh, organic molecules using conditions that like this, then great. Um, and uh, like I said, it's a little more complex than that. Sometimes you got to make sure you have a well-worded uh, hypothesis. So what are some things that science does not do? Um, science kind of doesn't really make moral judgments. Um, it's not really what it does. Uh, how do we even make knowledge of moral judgments or aesthetic judgments, right? Science doesn't say something is beautiful or ugly. Uh, science doesn't tell you how to use knowledge. Do you use nuclear power to make bombs? Do you use it to make electricity? Um, those are good questions. Uh, and like I said, it's not usually metaphysical, right? It's, it's uh, it's uh, restricted to the natural world. Okay, so a couple other things about this unit here. And uh, I'm going to actually just break slightly into uh, topic two here in a minute, but kind of just want to show you a couple of things about my, uh, about my notes and things like that. Um, so this is a, uh, a study tip, right? Uh, time, time to start thinking critically about things. You know, what kind of information are you, are you given, right? And uh, you take a look at my, uh, my notes, I usually have some kind of key concepts at the end of um, at the end of every unit, and uh, so always take a look at these and, and make sure that everything makes sense. Um, if not, go back and see where we covered that. What were we talking about? Um, to even help you further, I have some uh, uh, terminology words. Again, if you don't know what all of these things mean, it's important that you do look them up. Your textbook has a great glossary. Um, there's many other places you can look them up. And because um, a lot of these become the basis of questions. Sometimes I ask definition questions on my midterms, for example. Uh, and lastly, this is not something wrong with my PowerPoint. I also have study questions. And these study questions are not, um, they're not exam questions, by the way. These are kind of bigger concept questions. But usually when I make my exams, I start looking at these study questions and um, ask you more specific things, right? 
So you can see what are the two main types of cells. I'm probably not going to ask you that question. That's a little open-ended. But I'm going to ask you to describe the differences between the two types of main cells, which is something we're going to be getting into over the next few units. Uh, so that, that's it for topic one. Um, what I'm going to do is, um, like I said, just kind of um, introduce topic two. And uh, so just give me a second here. I got to pull it up. And uh, we'll get into topic two in a lot more detail on, um, on Wednesday. So don't forget that labs do start um, labs do start this Thursday. So I'll talk about labs a little bit more on, uh, on Wednesday and uh, what you can do to uh, get prepared for labs. All right, so topic two. Topic two is um, kind of like a little bit of uh, chemistry. Uh, so hoping you've seen most of this stuff somewhere before, um, but it's really important in this class and take other biology classes to know a little bit about the molecules that are essential for life. And so if you look at chapters two to four in the textbook, um, it talks about basic chemistry, water, and a few other things. Um, they're worth a quick flip. If it's been a while since you've done chemistry, or worth to flip through. We're mostly going to be focused on chapter five, which is the macromolecules, which includes the lipids, carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids. Um, so let's take a look at these things. If you take a look at a cell, a cell is, is mostly water, right? Um, it has uh, ions and small molecules, so things like sodium, potassium, calcium, things like that. And then it's made out of um, the rest of things as macromolecules. So about 15% proteins, uh, a little bit of RNA, a little bit of DNA, uh, usually some, some carbohydrates, that's what a polysaccharide is, and then uh, phospholipids, which is part of the membrane. So this is why it's important to talk about all these things and uh, understand what they're doing in the actual cell and understanding a little bit about their chemistry. So some chemistry for you. Uh, here's uh, a chunk of the periodic table. And um, all these ones here in purple, these are the ones that are essential for humans. Uh, the green ones, we're not sure, maybe. A little bit more research just needs to be done here. And um, when you take a look at these molecules, these are the most important ones. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. In fact, if you take organic chemistry, these are the molecules you talk about the most, and you talk about them all the time. So a reminder about how these things work. Um, all of these molecules, or sorry, all of these atoms have um, electrons around them, and those electrons can form bonds. And uh, sometimes we talk about unpaired electrons, or we might call them uh, unpaired valence electrons. So if you take a look, our, uh, hydrogen has one, oxygen has two, nitrogen three, and carbon four. So when you see these linked up, carbon will have four bonds, nitrogen will have three bonds, oxygen two, hydrogen one. And that's kind of how they link up. Um, they'll often link up into things that we call functional groups. And so you might see some of these functional groups and some of the molecules we're going to talk about. For example, this one here, when you, have a, when you have an oxygen and a hydrogen linked together, that is called the hydroxyl group or an alcohol group. We're going to see those on, for example, carbohydrates uh, and so on. Um, I'm not going to get into all of these. I'm not going to talk in, about them a ton uh, in this course, but you will see them if you take future courses in organic chemistry or biology or biochemistry and things like that. What I do want to talk about is the four different types of macromolecules, um, and these are the lipids, the carbohydrates, the proteins, and the nucleic acids. So before I talk about them, what I want to talk about is why these things are macro. So remember, um, macro means large. So all of these are large uh, organic molecules is what they are. And so um, usually uh, most of these also fit into the category of something called a polymer. So when people think of polymers, often they think of plastics because plastics are in fact polymers. But the definition of polymer is where you have a molecule that is linked up of similar or identical molecules. So if you take a look, there's a, there's a polymer there. We've got one, two, three subunits, right? And they're, oh, it looks like in that case, they're identical, but they could be identical or similar. And um, it, these polymers can get longer. And it, this is through a process called uh, a dehydration synthesis. And so if you take a look at this, we've got an H, 
and another H and an O. So all together, that is water. So what happens is um, during this process, this condensation or rehydration synthesis, um, those three atoms are removed and they become water, so dehydration. And then you link them together and you get a longer polymer. So I'm pointing this out because we are going to see this type of reaction um, a few times in this course when things are linked together. And uh, our textbook is calling this a dehydration synthesis reaction. Um, some textbooks call it a condensation reaction. So I usually what I try to do with this course is, is be consistent with the textbook. But if you have heard the other terminology, that is fine and totally acceptable. Uh, the last thing I want to say about this slide is that uh, you can actually do the reverse reaction. So the reverse reaction is where a water molecule is added to that bond and breaks the bond. It's called hydrolysis. If you take a look at this word, hydro means water, and lysis means breaking. So a hydrolysis reaction is a, is a breaking reaction. So dehydration synthesis, attaching things together, hydrolysis is breaking things apart. So pay attention and you'll, you'll see these, these reactions a few times, uh, particularly in this, in this unit where we're, we're gonna be linking things together. So another thing that I wanted to um, mention today is that I am going to be trying to uh, coach you and give you uh, tips on how to uh, um, do exams. Um, so my exams have a combination of uh, multiple choice and written components. So one thing I often do is have short answer type questions. So say a definition question, and I'll show you how this might work. And so usually the short answer questions are worth one mark or two marks or something like that. Uh, so here's a definition, define polymer. So when I'm looking for one mark, I'm not looking for one word, okay? I'm looking for one thought. Now, it doesn't have to be a sentence. You can make a nice grammatically correct sentence on an exam. I'm not so care, caring about sentences. You can do point form. But usually I'm looking for um, enough information here to give you a full mark. So in this case here, you can see I've kind of broken this up into two parts. Polymer is a large molecule with similar or identical building blocks linked by covalent bonds. So that would be the full mark. Um, if you, you're not sure if your definition is completely uh, uh, adequate, then always throw in an example. So an example would be, uh, you know, for example, uh, something we haven't talked about, but cellulose is a polymer of glucose. And when you give an example, you're always telling me that you understand it very well. So examples are always good. So I will present you with, um, with more um, tips on these, on these questions, particularly as we get closer and closer to the midterm, I'll be trying to give you a few more tips. So that is actually where I wanted to finish off today. Uh, next day, we're gonna get into the macromolecules. So we'll talk about probably we got through the first three lipids, uh, carbohydrates and proteins. Uh, I don't think we'll quite get into the nucleic acids until, uh, until Friday. Um, so I'll see everybody on Wednesday. We'll talk about the lab a little bit on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, we will, we will do lab one.